Our next speaker is Matt Hayton. He's the Managing Director for Makina Research. And Matt is going to be speaking on smart cities and smart strategies. Please could you all give a very warm welcome to Matt. Thank you. Thank you. I should stand on the, the spotlight so I can uh, I can be recorded and, and, and played back to people's hearts content apparently, so I'll, uh, I'll do that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Matt Hatton, I'm the director at Makina Research. Uh, my colleague Jim Morris was here yesterday, so if you were here, you already saw him. Hopefully we won't be covering too much of the same territory, but you never know. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, smart cities, smart strategies. So what I'm going to, going to talk through is a little bit about the, the research that we've been doing, a little bit of background about, about who we are and, and, and how we work, and then uh, looking at some of the, uh, some of the, the different approaches that have uh, already been taken to, to smart cities. So first slide is the obligatory about us. So we're a, a, a research consulting firm uh, specializing in, in machine to machine. So M2M is what we do. M2M is pretty much all that we do. Uh, so a little bit more detail on that. So our research sort of spans across two areas. First area is really to, to, to seek to quantify the, the opportunity, looking at the, the, uh, the demand side, the, uh, the, the services side, if you, if you like. Um, and we've done that through, through a, um, a very granular and detailed forecast, looking at each of the individual vertical sectors, a little bit more on that in a, in a while. And then subsequent to that, we, um, we then focus also on uh, some of the horizontal issues that cut across each of these, the, these verticals, so cut across automotive, healthcare, utilities, and, and, and so forth, looking at uh, things like uh, technology roadmap, things like module pricing, SIM strategies, and a, and, and a variety of other issues on, on, on top of that. Um, one of the things, one of the more interesting things we've been doing that sort of, sort of spans across both is, is to um, identify what the opportunity is for, for network operators. I suspect there's a, there's a lot of network operators in the room, so one of the things we've been doing is it's kind of looking at the opportunity in each of the vertical sectors looking at the opportunity for each application by country and then looking at which operators have the, the most appropriate strategies for, for hitting that, um, that, uh, that revenue target. And as a result, we can then build a view on you know, what the opportunity is for, for, uh, for each of the operators. You might have seen uh, something in the, in the press if you've been following the M2M press. Um, we published a, uh, a, our leaderboard back in February just before um, Mobile World Congress and then again in, in, in April. So that was an interesting piece. Um, so this is a little bit more about the forecast database, just to give you some context about what I'm going to be sharing. So uh, clearly there is no single thing called M2M. There's lots of different verticals, lots of different ways in which, in which connectivity can um, have a positive impact in terms of, in terms of I don't know, smart metering or, or automotive with uh, insurance telematics or, or, or a variety of different applications. Each of these applications completely different dynamics, completely different value chains uh, in many cases. And you've really got to drill down into the granularity, the specifics of each of those, those, uh, those vertical sectors in order to, to really understand and to look at each of the each of the applications within those vertical sectors. So, just to give you an example sector within the healthcare sector. Say we look at eight big application groups from road well and, and clinical remote monitoring to telemedicine, first responder connectivity, and within each of those, we look at, at uh, a, a set of sub applications within within those those applications. So, it gets to a very granular level of uh, level of detail. The result is massively complex and, and, uh, and detailed set of forecasts. I, I, won't, um, I won't dwell on this one too long, but it's looking at um, 54 countries, 60 application groups, connections, traffic, revenue. So this just gives you a, a little bit of background really on what we've done, the level of detail that we've looked at the market in, into in order to produce the, um, the research that we do. So this forecast database, the reports that we, uh, that, that we write on the, on the various vertical sectors, one of which is smart cities. Uh, now Tim, was, was, Tim mentioned a, a little bit earlier about um, some, of these, some of these drivers about, about urbanization, I think you mentioned about population growth and, and, and so forth. So a number of different drivers. I, I could have put up any, any number of different issues on, on this slide. They're, uh, they're a huge number. Clearly, uh, urbanization, there are now more people living in, in cities than living in, in, in rural areas now. So 
big, big, uh, big push in just in terms of the, the numbers of people, the addressable market, the addressable, addressable opportunity. And obviously that, that degree of urbanization brings uh, added pressure onto resources, um, and there is uh, a, a finite set of um, resources and, and, and capacity. So for instance, the, just the, the, the road um, capability. You, you think about somewhere like India where um, the, the road systems in, in a city like Delhi or, or, or Mumbai struggling now. As you get greater purchasing power for cars, you, you start getting a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure there. Um, reducing costs, that's another, another big push. Uh, the green agenda, so we, we, you know, obviously we see a lot of, um, uh, a lot of environmental pressure in, in order to, um, to, to, to push this, um, this requirement for, for, for smart cities. Theoretically, the, the smart city will be a, be a greener environment and a, and a, and a, more, uh, a more pleasant place to live. And obviously we've got pervasive mobile broadband networks, we've got a lot of technological development coming along, Tim's talking a little bit about sensors and, and, and so forth. Um, and there's also been a, something of a, a government push, there's been a lot of stimulus packages out, out there, M2M has, has actually tended to, to be a, a quite a significant beneficiary of a, of a lot of these, uh, these packages, which is a good thing, I think. Um, but really, what, what, there, there are two approaches to, to the smart city, two ways of, of, of thinking about the, the smart city. The first way, and the way that grabs the press, and the way that, that you tend to see things like a, a list of the, the top 20 smartest cities in the world, or, or the, the really attention-grabbing things, are these grand projets, as, as they were calling call them in, in France. So things like uh, Songo in, in, in South Korea, which is a, a brand new city, um, not, not actually that far from uh, from from, uh, from Seoul, but um, it's. A, a completely greenfield, fresh approach, new site. We've also got some more sort of um, vaporware, slideware type of cities, if you want to think about it, about it that way. But, but conceptually, the likes of Skolkovo in, in, in Russia and, and, uh, and Planet Valley in, in Portugal. A lot of um, detailed thinking going on, on, on about these things, but they're really very much in the, in the long term. There's a lot of development still need to happen, things around, uh, well, things around funding for a start, that's, um, that's seriously dried up in, in recent years, as you can, you can probably believe. Uh, things around how you actually link all of this stuff together, there's a lot of good work being done by the likes of, of, um, of Living Planet with the Urban OS, a bunch of other, uh, other firms as, uh, as well. Um, but really, we, we'd like to focus on what the opportunity is, is today. And we, we rather think it's, it's actually more about some point solutions. And, and I know that it's probably majority mobile network, or they probably considering the number of mobile network operators in the audience. And we tend to, to think of these things in terms of what the revenue opportunities for mobile network operators today, next five years, um, and that tends to be in these, in these, um, in these point solutions. I don't know whether it's po really fair to think of them as point solutions, but it's um, specific applications. So you've got the likes of uh, traffic management, so uh, something like a seamless street line, that's a, a good example of a, of a traffic management solution to, to detect where parking spaces are, to be able to advise drivers on where to, where to go in order to, um, to, to take advantage of, of parking opportunities. Look, Bit more on that on that later. Um, the DSA solution from from Dubai. I, I mentioned um, the uh, government investment in in, in terms of um, uh, kind of recovery plans. This was this is actually a, a government sponsored scheme to put um, information boards, connected information boards, on all railway stations. Uh, clearly, it's a it's a very focused one on a, on a particular. Um, uh, particular vertical, particular, particular application, but you know, it's all end to end, it's all, it's all valuable. Um, and CCTV, another application that fits into this, this category. So a lot of opportunity there, we think, in terms of, of, um, of uh, connecting a, a specific type of, type of device. I'm going to delve into those in a, in a little bit. So we really see there being, being four 
major application types within within in inverted commas smart cities. Although it's a, it's, a, it's a broader thing than that, there's a lot more to be stitched together. I'll, I'll come on to talk about that in a little bit. But in terms of um, really true smart city um, uh, vertical applications, these, the, these are the ones that we, we tend to think in terms of. So digital signage, very high bandwidth application. Um, it's, and it, it tends to be around just shifting large volumes of data. So very strong opportunity for, for mobile network operators in this, in this sector. Other big advantages, you tend not to be able to address it with roaming SIMs or with global SIMs. You have to have a local SIM, so you need to be an in-market operator. So you get, you get a, a big benefit from that. Uh, and as a result, it's a, a, a less heavily competed sector. Um, relatively high ARPU, so um, Sprint in the US was talking about there being a hundred dollar a month ARPU for for, uh, for digital signage. Now that's probably more likely to be the uh, the big signs in in Times Square rather than uh, the the you know a small bus stop um, advertising uh, sign. But um, the the evidence is clear. We, talk, we tend to think about M2M as being a, a very low ARPU um, sector, but actually there's some, there's some spectacularly high ARPU applications within there as well. Another one being, uh, being CCTV. Now, there is a uh, potentially a question mark over whether you, you, you tend to connect that using, using cellular or whether you use a fixed solution, but cellular gives a, uh, uh, an extra level of, of um, uh, flexibility in terms of, in terms of deployment, and it offers you the opportunity. And, and we see CCTV as being a, a significant opportunity, particularly right here in the UK, um, given that we're um, apparently the most surveilled society in the, in the world. So there's more CCTV cameras per head of population here in the UK than there is anywhere else in the world. There, there have been some, some shocking numbers out about uh, you know, one uh, camera per 13 people, but we've delved into that a little bit. We think it's more like one for every 300 people in terms of, of, of public CCTV. But nevertheless, big opportunity there, and, and again, relatively, uh, relatively high ARPA applications. Uh, traffic management. So managing the the, um, the the vehicles through the the cities, do, looking at things like uh, road tolling, uh, congestion charging, and, and and so forth, tends to be a, a more complex systems integration play. It's 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 more typically than the network operator can can manage, and they will need to look to to, to, to partners. So uh, that's going to be a recurring thing throughout the day, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So it's slightly less appealing one for, for network operators uh, the, here, but, um, but nevertheless, there's a, there's a huge potential in terms of numbers of, of connections and, and, and traffic. Um, public transport, again, a highly mobile application. Typically, it's, it's connecting buses and trains and, and, and so forth in order to, to provide central information and, and, and so forth. Relatively low ARPU application than that one. So, so those are what we think of as being the the, um, the really true smart city applications. If you think about the applications in that in that sort of vertical stovepipe um, uh, uh, view, there's also a wider set of applications that, that have an impact on the on the city. But we wouldn't really think of them as being in that in that vertical. So utilities, smart meter, smart grid, um, particularly electric vehicle charging. So all of these are, are, are relevant to be stitched into to a, a wider solution. Uh, connected cars. So allowing for an interaction between the between the vehicle and the environment. Again, it's extending that concept of smart city into uh, into the vehicle, into another into another vertical. Uh, healthcare. You, you could expect that connected living solutions or first responder connectivity uh, would would take advantage of, of um, something that we can conceptualise as the as the smarter city. Uh, building automation, supply chain. Supply chain is another another very interesting one. One I've been doing personally quite a, a lot of work on recently, and there's a there's a bigger opportunity, or there's a uh, the supply chain is is a, a critical piece of, of functionality, a critical thing to, to society to ensure the food value chain, particularly in uh, well we see we saw we saw strikes, we've seen snow. Th these types of issues can can have a potentially quite devastating impact on the on the the supply chain. Um, 
and that has, uh, and, and we need to conceptualize this as, as something that's really a, um, a, a for the public good type of type of an application. And so stitching that in is uh, into the the wider smart city again is a is a um, is an important role. But we, uh, as I said uh, well, earlier on, the. Um, this sort of top-down approach has been taken in the likes of of, of, of Songda isn't really the um, isn't really what we're seeing at the moment, and even in even in a vertical sector like the supply chain, um, where you've got uh, the transportation element, you've got the storage element, you've got retail and, and and so forth, even something like that, which could theoretically be be much more tightly integrated, it's still about point solutions. It's still for the large part, it's still about a, uh, a transport and distribution company having one one set of uh, of, of applications applications, a storage company having a separate set, retail and, and, and wholesalers all having their own separate uh, separate systems, which don't necessarily talk to each other, sometimes they do, sometimes they, they, they don't. But even in that vertical, it hasn't really come through, even when there's that demonstrable return on investment. Expecting that kind of thing to also happen in cities, well, it's going to take some time, right? The, without a, a, a very, um, well, it'd be fine if you were in a command and control economy. Um, where you're not, then it, it tends to be rather more, uh, more difficult to, to, to conceive that it's, um, it, it's going to occur in, a, in, in any rapid way. So, um, so really for us, the, the, what we see is, actually I'll, I'll talk through this slide as I've clicked onto the next slide, let's talk through this one. Um, so in terms of the, the, the revenue opportunity, that wider um, uh, smart cities, including all of those applications that are listed on the, on the right hand side of the slide, that's 60% of, of the revenue that's coming from, from uh, machine to machine. Okay, so I don't know whether Jim showed you a, a, a set of figures that look much like this yesterday, but um, the addressable revenue opportunity for mobile network operators, around 260 billion euros in, in 2020. 4% um, of that is smart cities and transportation, that category, that tight definition that I, that I shared with you earlier. Um, but the wider smart cities, including all of those automotive motor applications and, and, uh, smart, and, and the smart metering and, and electric vehicle charging and, and so on and so forth um, is 60% of, of revenue in, in 2020. And we start getting to the point where if by 2020, if you want to start thinking about generating revenue from those, those applications, you need to start stitching them all together. It probably is a seven, eight, nine year time horizon, but, but that sort of stuff is, is likely to be coming. Uh, oh yes. So something else that we we, um, we did recently, we did a lot of work for the for the GSMA, looking at the wider impact of what they term the connected life. So the the um, the approach here was to not just to look at what revenue can be generated by mobile network operators or or indeed any other players in the value chain, valuable though that is, it was to 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 delve into what the impact was on businesses okay, into, into, and society more, more generally, and to try and put a, a dollar value on, on that. So globally, um, the, the total impact in terms of uh, the ability to sell services over over end-to-end -end connections, so insurance telematics, say something like that, um, the ability to, to reduce costs and improve services, so uh, example of cost reduction might be smart metering, not having to send somebody out to read a meter, um, or a healthcare application, a, a, a remote monitoring application which stops somebody from, well, a needing a clinical intervention or, or, or be needing to go into a, a hospital. All of these things add up to a, around a $4.5 trillion impact. Now we take those, the, the smart city and transportation element, about $155 billion. So, but this is, all these figures are, are, are 2020, by the way. Um, so, we can see that, that be, above and beyond that, that revenue opportunity for the network operator, this is, in inverted commas, an important thing in, in terms of generating that cost saving revenue opportunity for, for third parties and so on, in terms of a sort of economic stimulus, I guess you could, you could think of it as. Um, one of the things we also did was to look at a, a top 10 
applications. Um, and number eight in that top ten was traffic management. So based on the growth of traffic from, from about 900 million cars in 2011 to, to 1.2 billion in, in, in 2020, um, we see connected road tolling, congestion charging, um, and, and, and so forth, generating about $100 billion dollars in, in, in revenue. So this is this is all stuff that's facilitated by by what we call M2M. A lot of it's already connected today, of course, so it's not it's not hundred billion dollars of, of new revenue but um, but it's it, it's still a it's a significant uh, significant area. Uh, one interesting stat to, to, to pick out from that is there's a study done in 2006 looking at uh, driving behavior um, and it found that five to ten percent of, of um, urban traffic and up to 60% in, in, uh, in small roads was actually people looking for a parking space. And if you can remove that, then obviously you gain that benefit 5 to 10% clearer roads or, or potentially 60% clearer roads in, uh, in uh, small, uh, small streets. So in terms of, of conclusions, uh, massive opportunity to, to, to drive efficiencies and, and improve urban living in, in many, many ways. We put that in terms of a dollar value of 155, $155 billion dollars of better living is, is perhaps the, uh, the, the way of thinking of it. Um, we tend to think that this, this top-down smart city is a, is a rare occurrence. It's, it's very eye-catching and, and, and quite, a, quite an appealing uh, message, but really um, it's about uh, the, uh, right now, it's about the, the specific applications, um, and over the next six, seven years, it's about stitching together those the, those applications into a uh, into a more meaningful whole. Although it's a challenge, the supply chain that I mentioned earlier, it, even within that, it's it's proved to be be something of a challenge to get these these applications to uh, to, to talk to each other. Um, it's around a 12 billion euro opportunity for mobile network operators in, in, in 2020, dwarfed by some of the other, other vertical sectors I know, uh, you know automotive utilities and, 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 and healthcare tend to, uh, tend to get a lot more of the, uh, of the coverage and they do generate a, a, a significant amount more money, but it's, it's kind of central to, the, uh, to, to a lot of other different applications. To, to Bill Ford speak at, at Mobile World Congress about, about, well, ostensibly about the connected car, but actually he starts drawing public transport and <clears throat> first responder connectivity and a variety of other, other issues. And it's absolutely the right, right approach, the right way to think about it is that all of these applications start to have, a, have an impact and the question is how are you going to uh, you know, stitch those together. Um, there is a big opportunity today though, digital signage, CCTV and, and, and so forth, there's, there's some, uh, some revenue to be made there. And with that, that's um, the end of my presentation. If there are any questions, I'll happily take those now. There is a gentleman over here. Um, Ian Ginn again, uh, Computaris. Yep. Just um, the, the question I have is around, uh, I was at the, actually at the MVNO uh, summit in Barcelona for the last few days. Okay. So there's also a, an overlap here where there's a merging between the mobile world and the M2M. So I think it's traditionally been seen as a slightly separate sort of industry. Yeah. Clearly M2M automation existed for an awful long time and people have, let's say, lived without necessarily the mobile connection. So is there a way of understanding the connectivity, and particularly around the urban city, that mobile creates, if you see what I mean, as a different, in the sense that which devices will have to be mobile or have SIMs, let's say, yep. as, um, as an added value to create that connected city. Um, clearly also there's obstacles like big buildings. I'm just wondering if you have any view because obviously data has been flowing between networks for a long time, but particularly the mobile aspect of it, which I think is what the hope is as well in the telco industry that somehow putting SIMs in everything is going to solve a lot of problems. Yeah. If you could just share some thoughts. It, it is a question that comes up quite a lot. How, how much stuff can you put SIMs in to, to, to characterize? Uh, the answer is obviously it depends by, by application. There are certain applications which naturally predispose towards being being uh, cellular connected. Anything that moves, for instance, is it, it naturally. So public transport systems, anything automotive related and, and, and so forth. 
The question then becomes, anything that's fixed to the ground, what's the opportunity there for, for, for mobile network operators? And we, we tend to think that in terms of ease of deployment um, and uh, just a, a, um, a more consistent approach to being able, able to deploy, you can, um, if you're a, uh, a company like um, Morofal, who, ha who have um, uh, lots of billboards and, and digital billboards and so on, they need one solution. Uh, and, and typically, it, it won't be in a location where there's a DSL connection. So they find, they, they find that cellular is actually the, the more, more appropriate technology. Um, even though it's, it, it's, sent, it's delivering large, large amounts of data. Um, there are, however, a lot of a lot of applications which are less likely to be to be um, uh, cellular connected. Consumer electronics devices. We tend to think that the opportunity in, in CE is, is is relatively limited, um, not least because uh, you're adding a significant amount to the to the bill of materials for the for the device just by adding cellular connectivity. So that's a that's that, that's more of a more of a challenge. Uh, in a lot of these urban um, applications, the the smart cities applications, there's also alternatives in terms of of um, mesh networks and community Wi-Fi and, and and so forth. So we um, anything that's more that, that has a more deep systems integration play. If it's not just about sending a box that you plug into a device that, that streams data, if it needs a more detailed or, or, or a, a, a more uh, more of a systems integration play, then that would tend to, to start steering away from, from cellular. So a lot of the traffic management systems and, and, and so forth will actually be using mesh networks and community and, and, and so forth. Thank you. There's two more questions. First from Olivia Ritz. Thank you. It seemed to be on. Okay. Anyway. Uh, I've got two questions for you. First one, you mentioned the government pushing in yeah. smart cities, um, which is a good thing because even if the business case is negative, they can push for it and support it. How will this uh, continue given the economic downturn? Will this have an impact on those kind of projects? And then the second question is around digital signage. Yeah. Now you mentioned high bandwidth, which is good for the telcos. But what is the business case for digital signage? Who will pay for the cost of that high bandwidth? Yeah. Okay. I'll take the last one first, and then I'll, I'll go back to the, to, to the other one. Um, so the, the use cases, there's, there's significant added value to, to the real estate of a, of a sign if you connect it. So um, sticking up a, a, a static ad is going to is not going to uh, generate as much money as being able to change it on a on a regular basis. And sending a guy oh, sending a guy with a stick is just not a, not as efficient to to upload upload data. Plus, with that degree of reaction activity it opens an opportunity rather than just doing brand based advertising you can do um, you, you can do um, other alternative form, forms of advertising so response based advertising um, and if you can do response based advertising and brand advertising that naturally adds to the value of the real estate because you can you, you've got a, a better ability to, to, to negotiate um, in terms of government stimulus packages well you know, it, it, it all depends on how you see the political situation and whether you see the, uh, the, the governments of the world r reducing their, their stimulus plans. We've seen a few um, examples of um, smart cities which might fall victim to um, uh, some of the economic um, e economic issues, some, something like um, Planet Valley. We don't know. Portugal's in a is is struggling a little, so so uh, not too sure. But um, uh, but there are others where it's it's a very political um, issue, and, and and they're very much uh, very much pushing it. So uh, so the, the the example I gave in in uh, in Russia, uh, I know it's it, it's a it's a pet project from from uh, from uh, Dmitry Medvedev. It's he he wants to push this. He's seeing it as a as a um, uh, Silicon, uh, Russia's Silicon Valley, if you like, um, and so he's he, there, there's a there's a high degree of of, uh, of political will to, to push it through, but it you can't generalise. There's there's so much variation between uh, between countries. There's one more question at the back. Um, so please could you give us your name and company as well? Thank you. Yeah. My name is, no. No. My name is Pankaj. I'm from Tatas. 
this is a question I, I think it's not covered in your topic today but I am interested to learn what are the different uh, ecosystems of the business model you will see which are going to evolve from a telecom service provider perspective and from a system integrator perspective and the solution oriented companies perspective I mean, I'm sorry I, I, you, you need to repeat the question okay the question is how do you see what kind of business models or the ecosystems potentially can you evolve have you done some kind of a research on that also from an end-to-end -end perspective yes it's it's um, um how, how long have you got that's the uh, that's the might be a good one to discuss can, can we take it offline in the in, in the break because i could ramble on about that for, uh, for for hours and hours um in terms of of of, um, of of business models there are untold numbers now what i talked through here in terms of the uh, the initial earliest market applications will tend to be through uh, direct relationships between network operators and, and the end users, although possibly with a value-added reseller in, in there in the middle, um, in, in a lot of cases. Um, some of the more heavy systems integration pay will be led by a, a, a systems integrator. I won't name names, just to stay neutral, um, with, which will typically just use the network operator for for, um, for connectivity. Or in, in many cases, it's, it's a sort of partnership approach. The two, two go and, and, and approach the, um, the, the city or, or, or whoever is a um, as a, a, a two-party deal, um, but there are many other other ways that it, it, it can work. So, that if if you're happy, we'll, we'll talk about it in the in the in the break. I think. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Well, I suppose that's it. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Thank you.